This is a classic blues and R&B podcast. We're talking to Sam Cockrell here. He's a musician out of Chicago. Uh, he uh, has uh, three uh, CDs out, uh, albums or what have you. And uh, we're talking to him about music in general. And uh, it's uh, he's just explaining what, what he thinks the, that's, uh, is the difference in music today and some of the young artists, you know, that they think that... Uh, <laughs> the commercials that they hear on TV using the music of uh, that uh, Al Green has played and others. You know, they they call that old stuff until they hear the commercial and they see a new truck behind it. But anyway, Sam is explaining this to me about what he thinks. Where do you think the music is headed, Sam? Well, I mean, you know, just to back up from what you just said, we talked about, take a guy like John Mayer, for example. John Mayer is a young white guy who, uh, you know, is a great player, uh, pretty good singer, and he went and played the blues, and those same young white kids that repelled it when they heard some of the masters doing it, they gravitated toward it. So it's just, it all depends on who's doing it. They have an influence on their audience, and they'll get them to listen for a short time. I, I think pretty much the blues is like, Basketball, basketball is getting to be positionless. There's no such thing as, as a position. You're a basketball player or not. You're a musician or not. So a lot of times that means that people expect for you to know a little bit about everything. So if you get called to do something, you can. I think that ideally if you don't feel inspired by something, then you shouldn't do it for money. But as a musician, you should try to be as well-rounded as possible. That's why I write my own songs. So this way, I don't have to try to mimic anybody. Of course, there's no new thing under the sun, so no matter what you do, it's going to remind somebody of something because that's where you draw inspiration from. But in most cases, most musicians are pretty good at creating something off of something else that inspired them. Everybody has done it, and it would take, I wouldn't say a genius, but somebody that's really paying attention to say, oh, wow, that, you might have got this from that. But... At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Either you like it or you don't. So I always say this. I don't look to make any particular music. Hopefully it's good. I don't make black music. I don't make white music or so on and so on. I just play music and hopefully the people that hear it, they embrace it. You know, 90% of my audience the past 10 years because of the venues I've played in have been predominantly white just because there have been certain places on the south side that they couldn't really afford to spend the kind of money that you need to support a six- or seven-piece band. And I would love the players, I've told you many times, on the south side, but we just can't seem to get all that stuff together. And maybe we might with the pandemic coming to an end, because it's certainly changing everything. It's going to change it the way people are going to get paid, perhaps, due to the fact that we're still dealing with COVID, and there's not a lot of places that are going to allow you to stack people up and uh, depend on the door to pay bands. So that's a thing that I think is going to have to be adjusted to by musicians. Now, uh, speaking of that, you know, and then I get back to another question I had. This here just prompted another uh, question, uh, current current question. Now, you... Uh, it's talked about the pandemic, yeah, and I noticed a lot of uh, musicians are uh, doing what they call vir- virtual programs. Have you uh, ever thought about venturing into that? You know, during during this period, even though some people are doing it alone, and some are doing it in a studio or setting where they do have cameras recording it or what have you. Have you uh, given any thought to that or not? Or is that a possibility or what? Well, I mean, anything is a possibility, but right now there are way too many people doing it here and abroad. Okay. So it's it really is not something that I'm doing right away. And, and and a lot of people don't know you know this. I've been dealing with some health issues that require me to sit back and uh, get fully healthy, uh, which I'm pretty much close to being that. But at this point in time, I'm just writing and taking it easy. And when the opportunities present themselves to perform with my band or other people, then I will. But right now, I think that there's enough people 
um, doing virtual gigs that they don't necessarily need another guy unless someone, hey, what about you? We'd like to see your band and do a virtual concert. That would be different. But outside of that, no, I haven't really given much thought to that for the reasons that I just mentioned because everybody else is doing it. So, you know, and at the same time, if you're absent from the public, that might create more interest of when they get to see you or how come they haven't seen you. Hmm. And that in itself is a good marketing thing, even if you didn't intend it to be. So if you see the same bands every week, every month, sooner or later, you're going to get tired of seeing those guys. No matter how good they are, you want to hear and see something else. Yeah. And I've always pretty much had that feeling that I'd rather be seen less than too much. I got that, yeah. Now, what have you been doing with yourself during the pandemic? I know you say you're working with your health, but have you been working on music of any kind or any kind of uh, uh, other products that you're thinking about doing or anything? Oh, absolutely. I've been, uh, I mean, I, I write songs primarily every, every day. Some ideas are good, some aren't. So those go on the back burner. And I'm uh, finishing up an album for the band. It's going to be 30 songs as I've told you before, on my new CD. And then I'm working on a couple tracks for some guys that uh, are friends of mine that uh, have been, i played music with over a period of time. And I'm going to help them with their career by writing music for them. So I've never stopped writing music. I've just pretty much kind of been pacing myself about working because, again, the band hasn't been together because of COVID. And until those guys get totally comfortable with it, we're going to stay stagnated until that time. And But while that's going on, I'm doing other little things to keep myself sharp and writing music. And uh, in the foreseeable future, I see this album coming out. Uh, this is uh, April. Yes. Probably by the end of the year because it's a lot of work doing a one album but when you just start doing 30 songs which is the equivalent of three albums 10 mm -hmm. songs per track that's a lot of work and uh, it, it takes time especially when you want to craft it right so I would probably say 2022 is a more realistic uh, time for the band to reemerge. not that we won't do nothing now but realistically where we will have this new album under our belt we can rehearse and entertain people and maybe by then the pandemic will be completely lifted and there'll be no more restrictions in terms of people and we can go back to having uh full houses of people and expect to make the money that we made previously if not more now during your career have you uh produced other artists or just strictly yourself no i, I have produced other artists and written lots of songs for other people now they never followed through, so it never became part of the public domain. But yeah, I've always been a writer or a person to lend a hand and help people out. But it's not easy putting out a record, you know, not just from an economical standpoint, but just the standpoint of having the ability to go through the process. It's, it's a long process of putting every part together, getting people to cooperate, and coming together as a unit to perform the record in the studio and then make the decision to manufacture the record for the public domain. So it's, it's easy to say, but not that easy to do. And if people don't have the finances, then you know, you're dealing with, in most cases, inferior productions that sound like they came out of somebody's basement, you know, that wasn't equipped to give you a professional sound. And and most I think, you know, uh, most people, if they could, they would. And nowadays, it's a little easier with the technology that you can get pretty good recordings, but I don't trust that. I still want to be in a studio and, and do it the old-fashioned way because there's certain things that you just get used to. I'm from that old school, and I'm sure there are guys that are really good at what they do, but I wouldn't feel comfortable not knowing the quality that I'm going to get until it's too late. You know, you need to hear something from that studio if you can't hear what they did before then it's probably not a great idea to invest that much time or money in that situation go to a rentable place that you know has turned out really good stuff from a sonic quality now what studios have you used in the past you uh, 
You know? Well, I mean, I've, I've used uh, Paragon. I've used uh, Paul Serrano. I've used uh, CRC. I've used some other studios uh, right now. I'm trying to rack track on the north side. Uh, there's a studio R. Kelly recorded that uh, years ago. That's on the north side. I can't remember the name of it, but I've been on a lot of studios. Ed Cody is an old, old guy, pioneer on 18th Street. We used to record down there. So I've been in a lot of, I recorded down in, in uh, Memphis, Nashville. I've been on a lot of different studios. And uh, one thing I learned is that the quality that you receive from the equipment and the experience of the engineer is paramount to a good product. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Ed Cody. I, <laughs> the last studio I was in with was what with him, uh, with an artist by the name of uh, John Moore, Johnny Moore. Oh right, yeah, Johnny Moore, the guitarist and vocalist. Uh, yeah, and he was a musician as well, a singer too. He did singing, so he was there recording a, stu- a song at uh, on that studio. That was the, the last studio on Michigan Avenue. On Michigan Avenue, right? It right. Was, I wonder what happened to him. Too. He still had his old long hair. I don't know if he had it when you first met him or whatever. Well, yeah, but I'm I, I'm pretty sure through the grapevine that I heard he he's deceased now. You know. Oh, okay, I, I have not. That's been, yeah. Henry, that's been for me. That's been over thirty five. Yeah. Close to forty years ago when I was uh in my teens. Uh-huh. Yeah, now when <laughs> you mentioned that now. Yeah, when you mentioned him, I thought about it. I said, yeah, the last uh, st- uh, studio on Michigan Avenue. He Absolutely. was a, he was the engineer there with his big uh, four um, big uh, two, one, two inch tape video uh, tapes, two inch tapes right, and all that stuff. Twenty four yeah. tracks, yes. Right. Yeah. You know the funny thing about Ed Cody was to most of the guys like me, Ed Cody was the equivalent to the Chess Brothers. Uh-huh. You know, all the guys that didn't go to the, ch- the Chess wound up at Ed Cody. <laughs> and I think it's just a matter of uh, economics and the fact that uh, Chess Brothers were always busy because they had, you know, big bangers coming in. Rolling Stones, all the British groups, and the up and coming, Holland Wolf and Muddy Water. So it was hard to get into that place. But So we had to deal with Ed Cody, which was great for us, but that's the level we were at at the time, you know, and so it kind of worked out. And uh, I think, like I said, I, I look back at some of those days and look at all the stuff that I learned, even when I wasn't trying to learn something. Those are the lessons that I take with me today, you know, and so basically, I think that all of that was necessary to mold you into the person that you have become if you continue progressing or working toward being something in the music business and yeah, that, that, that's not easy because you can get very frustrated for a number of reasons money being the main one and then people not sticking together and breaking up and regrouping that all oh, that's very frustrating and it leads you to hang it up and say hey i think i'm gonna do something else it's too much work yeah uh what was the name of your first cd my first who cd well at that time, they didn't have CDs. Well, okay, your first album. That, that's uh, okay. technology. Uh, you're right. Well, we didn't we didn't get that far with the album. We had recorded several singles of 45s, as they were called back then. We recorded a couple of songs. One of them to date was, I remember, was called Indestructible Black Man. And on the flip side, we had a song called The Rocking Chair. We recorded a song on a vocalist, uh, named Henry Ford. It was called Jan O' Jan. We also recorded, a, a, I can't think of the guy's last name, his name was Cecil. It's called Why You Laughing. Uh, Larry Ball was a producer on both of those tracks uh, with Jan, with Henry Ford and, and, and uh, Cecil. They were great songs. You know, I, to this day, I don't know where any of that stuff is because I wasn't uh, in the producer's role at that time. I was the leader and, and uh, helped arrange some of the things, but for the most part, I was just a student of the game then, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you just said something. When you're speaking of uh, arranging, what does an arranger do in music? Well, an arranger takes, like, we'll, we'll, we'll go to something more basic and pedestrian. An arranger takes pieces of a puzzle and he puts them together in their proper place so that he can present you the picture that the puzzle 
is. Because when the puzzle's out of place, it's hard to figure out what it is. So the arranger takes each instrument and places it where it's supposed to go in conjunction with the other instruments. And then at the end of the day, we have what we call a product arranged by so-and-so for this purpose. Otherwise, nothing would make any sense. People would be playing whatever they wanted to, coming in in the wrong place at the wrong time. So an arranger is actually part of being a producer. They both kind of do similar things in most cases. I'm the arranger and the producer, as well as the writer. That's not always like that, because sometimes people work with groups. I prefer to work alone. Not that I'm opposed to work with anybody, but at the end of the day, it's my word that matters. And I don't want to have to be in conflict. We shouldn't do it that way. I don't have that problem, because I'm the beginning and the end of the uh, conversation. Okay. Now, what was the first CD, the uh, first album that you made? What was the first album that you recorded? Uh, the first, the first, again, it was an album, but it wasn't fulfilled. We did a single, and it was called You Gotta Get Up. It was done with uh, Kevin Bell, who was better known as Amir Bayan, Cool in the Gang. He was one of the members of Cool in the Gang before he became a Muslim. And uh, we didn't make any money <coughs> off that record. We got some acclaim for doing it and uh, some notoriety, but yet no money. And we didn't write the record. We produ- produced it and arranged it, but he was the writer. So it was that, that's how it should have been. But we were made a lot of promises that didn't ha- they weren't kept. And so that was just another valuable lesson, be in control of what you do. You know, if you're in the back, you don't have any say about where the car is going. So I took myself out the back seat and put myself in the front seat. So I became the driver. So I don't work with anybody anywhere unless that's understood. You know, at the very beginning, you know, I'm my own producer and arranger. Now, if we can collaborate, it's because we had a talk and it makes sense to me, but I, I, I don't foresee that because it's very hard to find another guy that's going to think along the way that you are and not have any discord about him wanting to do this or you wanting to do that. So you have to become the driver if you're going to be the leader in uh, anything you do musically. Otherwise, you're going to have to listen to somebody else's idea that you may not agree with. Mm. Now, you've got a couple of songs that I'm familiar with your CD uh, with your albums you know, and um... well yeah later on with the CDs came to be and uh, that's when the CDs were uh, showcasing me as an individual as the artist opposed to being you. part of the band okay maybe you are so that, that's... And one other thing that we're talking about this that's important for people to know mm. if you look at the back of most records or CDs you'll see that there's an executive producer and a co-producer. And the co-producer, in most cases, is the creative force behind the record. The executive producer is the guy who's giving you the money to make the project happen. And in most cases, they don't typically know anything about it, but at, they feel that they have a say because you're spending his or her money. That's another thing that I made clear. If you give me the money, it's because you believe in what I'm doing. I don't want you to micromanage this project, especially if I realize you don't know nothing about what we're doing. So that's the other thing that people have to not get caught up in, is getting with a producer that knows nothing, but you're spending his or her money, and they feel like they have a right to inject this or that to what you're doing. Okay, yeah. I got you. The executive producer is always the guy with the the woman with the money, you know. (laughs) With the money. Yeah. (laughs) So, okay, now, as I mentioned earlier, that you had uh, three uh, three albums out, you know. Uh, What's the name of those albums? The first album, which came out in 1999, is called I'm In The Business. And that album is predominantly what I would call progressive, traditional, blues with a R&B edge to them. 
Okay. Uh, who were some of the guys on there with you? Do you remember? Or is it? Uh... Yeah, I remember everybody. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, some of the main characters outside of myself, uh, the band members, uh, Rob Davis was the drummer. Uh, we had several guitar players before this. We, the guy that joined the band, he was more prominent on the second album. So I had Carl Willisby on the first album. I had Jimmy Johnson, Maurice John Vaughn, Brother John or John Khaki. He also was the piano player and organ player on the on the album. Uh, Will Crosby was another uh, player. I had Michael Coleman, who's now deceased. Uh, Robert Fetcher was another guy that played guitar. Mike Wheeler played some minor bits on the record before he uh, got with Delmar. This was many years before his thing with Delmar. Now, and uh, Kevin Johnson uh, was one of the drummers. He played on a couple tracks. Howard Shaw, uh, saxophonist. Billy Branch was also on the album. Uh, ben Roof was a uh, harp player from England who was introduced to me by Jack Letourneau, the uh, engineer and co-producer of that album. Uh, I think I pretty much got everybody involved. I think I named everybody. And uh, yeah, I think I named everybody on that album. Russ Green showed up for the session. He's a harp player. But it didn't work out. Uh, him, that was some some crazy stuff with him and Michael Coleman, and it didn't work out. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Russ was there on some of the sessions. That was pretty much it for the first album, which, like I said, came out in 1999. And what about your second album? What was the name of it, and when did it come out? Second album was out in 2001, and that was called that was called Colorblind. That was recorded initially in uh, Memphis, Tennessee with the Memphis Horns, the world famous Memphis Horns. Uh, crazy story how all that came to be. We were down there for the uh, the uh, the awards, the, the, uh, the Blues Awards, the IBC, International mm -hmm. Blues Competition. And uh, oddly enough, I was in the bathroom with Wayne Jackson, the trumpet player, who is deceased, along with Andrew Love, saxophone, both deceased. We're in the bathroom, and, and I say, hey, man, man, I really love what you guys do and all the work you did with Robin Cray and, and uh, the uh, Otis Redding and all those guys. I would love to get you on my record. I say, but the only problem is I don't have that kind of money. He says, well, look, take my number. Give me a call, and we'll work something out. And sure enough, about three months after that, when I get back to Chicago, we came back to Memphis to start recording in Royal Studios. It was House of Blues, I mean, sorry, House of Blues Studio in Memphis, Tennessee. And we recorded seven tracks, and I remember that cost me $3,500 to have the Memphis horns on my album. Everybody went, how did you do that? Man? I said, man, I just guess I got lucky. And that was such a big moment for me because I admired all the work they had did with Robert Cray, and, uh, you know, a lot of my music, not purposely, reminded people of that and I said okay that's good then they ought to fit right in which they did and uh, we had uh, some of the same cast on that record uh, Rob Davis once again was a drummer uh, we had um, Chris Forte became the guitar player of the band so he did predominantly most of the guitar work outside of Joanne Connor. She plays fly guitar here in Chicago. The late, great Chico Banks was on the album. Ronnie Baker Brooks, Ronnie uh, Brooks' son, he was also featured on the album. Uh, again, John Khaki played uh, piano, organ, and I think uh, on one or two tracks, one of the guys I grew up with named Rick Perkins played on uh, clavinet on a, on, uh, yeah, on a couple songs. Uh, who else? Hmm. I, I think that's pretty much it. I named the drums, the bass, and a guitar player. Yeah, that was pretty much the the crew on that album. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2001, my father passed away. <laughs> and so at that time, unbeknownst to me, uh, 
I took some time off. I didn't realize his death had affected me the way that it did. Mm -hmm. you know, not that I was depressed, but just for some reason, it took me out of circulation. Because my next album didn't come out until 14 years later. That wasn't some strategy or, or, or marketing thing. It just happened. I started taking jobs with other bands, you know, not wanting to deal with uh, being a leader or being responsible for all the stuff that it, it takes to be a leader, setting up tours and gigs and have you. So I went to work with some other bands and promoted my CD at their shows. I mean, I, I talked to the guy first and said, well, look, if I help you, I need you to allow me to promote my CD on your show. I would never do it behind his back without telling him. And so at that time, I was doing a lot of work with Big James and Chicago Playboys because they had just lost their bass player, a friend of mine, Larry Williams, and I uh, said it with him because it was a means of me to keep making some revenue and help them in the process and go to a bunch of venues that I hadn't been to and pass my CD out in the hope that later on I would be able to bring my own band. So that happened on a couple of occasions. And... Um, after a while, I got the itch. You know, when I mentioned 14 years, I got the itch. I had started writing songs during this particular time for the third album, which is entitled Trying to Make a Living Playing My Guitar. And a good friend of mine named Joe Lasort, who was the executive producer and engineer, uh, lived in Delaware. He used to live here in, in uh, Illinois and had been trying to get me to come down there for about 25 years. And so... Finally, it happened. I went there, and we started recording this album, Trying to Make Living Play My Guitar, where he was the uh, main guitarist uh, on this album, along with another guy who sung lead vocals, Roger Girk, also another great player from Delaware, Lynn Daltry, another guitar player from Delaware, Billy... Ah, wow... Man, I hate to forget good names. Well, that happens to I mean, it, you I, know. I'll get back to Billy in a minute. Maybe I'll, his name will come up. Yeah, that, can, uh, that happens to all of us, you know. What's that? That happens to all of us. You know, we forget yeah, about I, some I, of the I, people. I, that, forgive me, Billy. <laughs> yeah. I'll think of it before we finish talking. Brett Show was was uh, was a drummer on this. Uh, Billy played drums on a couple tracks, but Brett Show, who I met, both guys I met in Delaware, played predominantly the uh, album and he came in did a fantastic job they both did and we continue to talk to this day uh, a friend of his Daryl Brown keyboardist performed on a couple of the numbers on uh, their only the album but Daryl Brown performed Daniel Tavian who I think you've met a couple times a Filipino uh, guy he's a, he's a keyboard player in my band uh, a while back and he is the, the keyboardist who predominantly played everything on the album, piano, organ, with the exception of the few tracks that Daryl Brown did. And he was very instrumental in uh, this album working because he and I think a lot alike. You know, I mentioned earlier, it's hard to find somebody that thinks the way you, but he and I think a lot alike musically. And so it was really easy for me to articulate my ideas to him because we both like the same kind of stuff. And was easy to say, hey, do this. And if I did this, he would automatically do the next thing. So, yeah, he was very instrumental in coming down there and putting his stamp on it. Um, I wrote everything, but his imprint is over all over the album as well. So I have to give him a lot of credit for that. You know, he's very uh, creative in the sense that, you know, he just can hear stuff. And we have a relationship where it's easy for us to, like I said, work together and, and almost the right thing happens all the time and I think uh, hmm. uh, I think that's all of the players I hate to name people and then you know forget somebody and, and if you forget somebody it's just simply because of old age and you just can't always remember and they'll say well why how did you forget me and I'm like I wasn't intentional it just happened that way and I'm trying to Billy Myers that's <laughs> it I went on Facebook and found a name Billy Myers who was the first guy on the, the record with me 
on the uh, track down there. He did an incredible job on a couple of those tracks, and I'd like to thank him again. And uh, after that, you know, it's funny, Henry, that five years went by. Well, now six, because this is 2021. That album came out in 2015, if I didn't mention it. Came out in 2015, tried to make a living playing my guitar. And six years have gone by just that fast. And it's amazing. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's time to do another album. Well, you don't have to, but I like to end my career uh, with 10 albums. You know, and I say that because I'm 62. I'll be 63, God willing, in September. And, you know, as you get a certain age, some guys may or may not want to continue that. It's a lot of work. You know, as you get older, you just naturally slow down and you don't have the same desire. I feel a lot younger than what I am, but I just don't know if I want to take on those challenges of uh, going through them. Because people, I don't know, they're not buying CDs or albums at the rate they used to. And at the end of the day, if I don't have a lot of stuff planned, for the CD, then I don't really see any real reason to pursue it other than just a personal goal. I like to have 10 CDs when I hang it up and say, yeah, well, you know what, that was quite an accomplishment for a guy who had no formal training and uh, just came from the ground up to become what he became. Because you know? I think I was quite influential to a lot of bass players and musicians who played the instrument and saw my style and saw something that they thought they could do. And, again, I think, like I said, I think I'm the first, well, not the first, but one of the first bass players who uh, kind of like had a individual style who was a leader of his band and also the, the, the lead vocalist. So that's not something you find too often in the blues field. You had Willie Kent. You had J.W. Williams, but both of those guys were great players, but they didn't really, that wasn't their skill set. The slap, pop, and, you know, play the bass like a guitar, which is, they didn't have to, you know, but that's just the evolution of the instrument. After seeing guys like Stanley Clark and Victor Wooten, that people, they loved it. You know, it wasn't traditional for some, but it was who I was. And so I decided... You know, I don't have to be like the other guy. I have respect for him, but I need to be me. And this is who I am. This is how I can express myself this way. And it's been working for me ever since I did it. That's interesting. <clears throat> it's very interesting when you say that, you talk about your style, and your style was to use the little funk and everything else. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, because it, it, it's all from the same place. It's, it's all... Uh, American black music, you know, and people categorize it, but at the end of the day, it's just an expression or a feeling, and people can call it whatever they want to, but it's all the same thing. It's just music that hopefully makes people feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now, which uh, one of your CDs would you say have made it the, high, the highest on the chart? Not that it matters, but it's, you know, that's uh, part of marketing. Out of your three CDs, which one has reached the top? Or, or can you tell me the uh, level you know, of all of them? All of them. What are I they? would probably say, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. That's kind of a tough question because unless you have uh, somebody monitoring everything that it did, and I and I don't, and I and I didn't, I would probably say the first one. Okay. Because I think the first one is is, is uh, curiosity. Okay. People say, oh, yeah, I've seen him a lot. He's got an album out. Let's let's check it out. <laughs> and then they have an assumption that every other song is going to be me playing a whole lot of notes as a bass solo opposed to presenting a composition, you know, that features singing and other instruments. And I think the curiosity to find out what it would be is what prompted that to be probably the most popular not that the other two weren't as popular but i know the first one for that reason sold quite a bit because that was the thing that now puts you on your own as an artist opposed to being in a band or being associated with someone else because like i said 
for about five years, I worked with Cicero Blake. And uh, we traveled, you know, everywhere pretty much, especially in the South. We went overseas. And uh, it was a great learning experience. And like I said, that was another thing that really let me know it was time for me to do something. You know, I was pretty content with uh, being his musical director, but we had a couple personal issues that uh, created a situation where it was time for me to leave, you know. And that was the beginning of me knowing that I could do it on my own. I always felt that, but then you have to prove it. And so I did. Mm. Have you ever been band director for any other artist or any other group? Well, unofficially, I've always been the band director for everything I've been a part of, but that was the first commercial artist okay. mm -hmm. that I was a band director for because most of the other times I was busy not trying to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was trying to discover myself and playing behind a, a, a singer who was, you know, I don't want to say set in his ways, but had some, you know, traditional ways. That's not ideally the best way to discover yourself doing something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Cockrell, I want to thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, I noticed that uh, uh, you speak, uh, spoke of dra drama in your uh, in your band. Uh, Bill, what is his name? Billy Jones, a uh, uh, young man that just passed away here. Billy Jones. Yeah, uh, BJ, I think his name is. I think. Oh no, no, BJ was no. I've known him like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, uh, Brad. Yeah, okay, Brad B.J. Jones. Yeah, okay. Right, Brian Jones, uh, you know, great drummer. He did security at the Kings of Mind. Yeah, he played with a lot of different artists. And uh, I never, he was never officially in my band, but we were, you know, we know each other. Mm. Had respect and talked a lot. So, yeah, it, it's a sad day for him and his family. But as I always say, even if it was me, if you're in pain and the quality of your life isn't good, then he's better off in peace than he is suffering just for people to see him linger. Yeah, seemed like he had some uh, health yeah, issues that had been lingering for a while, right? Yeah, he did. I mean, I, I knew what they were, but I, I don't remember, so I don't want to put it out there that, that might be, hey, he didn't have that, you shouldn't be saying that. Right on, right. So right. I won't do that, but yeah, he was a good guy, great drummer, and uh, very entertaining. He was very entertaining. Yeah, so on the Facebook posting, I saw quite a few people paying trip, uh, tributes to him, and they seem all to be complimentary. Yeah, yeah, because we we all we all know him to be a great dude, mm -hmm. and like I say, he was a good player. And so, like I say, you know, you, a lot of people you meet in life, and you have a good rapport with, and you know that's what happens. You see them when you do them, you greet them with a smile, a handshake, and you keep on going, mm -hmm. and you wish them well. And anytime somebody that you know passes on, it's always a tragic thing. But in life, we know that that's just something that's going to happen to all of us. All right. Point. Eventually, yeah. All right. Anything else you want to share with my audience here before I let you go? I really appreciate this, man. It was a impromptu. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I just want them to know they already know this. Support your blues man. Without him, <laughs> there's a lot of great music you would never hear. And without him, you wouldn't hear this interview. So I know you do, and I support him. And I hope the rest of the guys that understand him playing that record, how important that is for them, even though it may not show itself right away. You never know who's listening, but more importantly, how many people are listening. Thanks for joining our podcast here on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to us at HenryCB6175. Follow us on Twitter at WVONHenry and like our Facebook page at Classic Blues and RB.